everybody, welcome back to my channel. So, we are currently in the middle of the Mexico major, and today is actually the, the, the gap day between the group stage and the playoffs, and it has been an emotional roller coaster. You know, back when I did my videos during SI, I didn't really think it was going to get more crazy than that, but apparently I was mistaken. Anyway, before we actually get into the playoffs, I really wanted to do just this little video talking about a couple of the crazy things that we've actually seen happen in the group stage so far. So here we go. Okay, firstly, Na'Vi not winning a single game. This is so far from the expectations that I had that I had to include it. Prior to the Mexico Major, Na'Vi, I believe, had the most number of SI points uh, out of any team in the entire circuit, and a pretty much, I think it was 99.9% .9 or 99.7% guaranteed to qualify for SI. So, regardless of what was going to happen, Na'Vi were going to get there, but the point is, is that this year, they have been doing exceptionally well. And even at the time of making this video, Na'Vi are currently sat in second behind only Team Liquid, and in third is BDS, who only need to pick up another 60 points to actually overtake them. They finished first in stage one of the EUL this year, they came third in stage two. Not once in stage two did they ever have an overtime game, really decisive games that they ended up playing. So to come into Mexico and lose all of their group stage games, two of which were overtime losses, was really not what I was expecting. So this was obviously the group with just three teams, which meant that Na'Vi only had to play two other teams. But you have a look at the maps that they decided to play uh, against SSG and Furia, and this is where like some of my question marks come in. So SSG, we already know, are really well known for their kind of like highly strategic maps. Well, the maps that Na'Vi played against them were Cafe and Villa. Now, Cafe is one of, if not their best map in recent months. And Villa, they haven't played so much, so fair enough there, but it's still a very strategic map. Then you have a look at Furia, who are known for very aggressive playing. And that's where Na'Vi played them on Chalet and Coastline. Now, in the last three months... Furia have won every single chalet game that they have played, and Coastline is also one of their strongest maps. So to me, from the outside, it just looks like Na'Vi took these teams to their own stomping grounds, and I don't know how conducive to success that is. Judging by the outcome, the answer is probably not very. It doesn't hurt Na'Vi's chances of going to the Six Invitational 2022, but it's certainly going to sting their pride, um, and we'll see what happens with them in Stage 3. The next one I have to talk about is Damwon Gaming knocking out NIP because again this is so far removed from probably anybody's expectations that So, I mean, the APAC storyline in Mexico has been crazy anyway. Um, you know, before any major event, it's always discussed which region do we think is going to be the best performing, which region do we think is going to be the worst performing. And in a lot of cases, people typically expect APAC to be the worst performing region. They're still going through a lot of development. They haven't quite caught up to where LATAM were when they went from being a developing region to being a really dominant region. Um, and there are a lot of reasons that people discuss uh, for why that might be. But um, this event has seemingly tipped that on its head, I think, because every single APAC team that is here um, has really impressed. And Dan One definitely sits at the top of that list. So you also have to consider as well that this is the event that NIP themselves said we want this to be kickstarting our dynasty. Um, you think back to the G2 Penta dynasty and really NIP are trying to put their own version of that on the board right now. They just won SI. They've had a really dominant run in the BR6 so far this year and they want to be coming in and saying, right, we're going to come and win these majors. We're going to dominate Rainbow Six for the foreseeable future. So for that to go down the drain in the way that it has is really quite shocking. They didn't have a single regulation win in the group stage uh, in Mexico, which is, is funny because you compare to stage two of the BR6 this year, where it took five play days for NIP to even be beaten. So that in and of itself is quite a stark contrast. Now, I, I honestly think that, that Danwon here is, is such, um, it's, it's such a perfectly quintessential story 
of a big successful organization that comes into this developing region, provides the investment and the resources that are needed to actually create an environment where you know, is conducive to winning. It's conducive to this international success. And it oftentimes these discussions come up in esports that really boil down to, um, you know, you're not going to find success until you uh, inject investment, right? Until you provide those resources, things like these gaming houses, these boot camps, uh, these, the way of like treating players, even things as simple as does your team have a sports psychologist which is one that comes up quite a lot and, and whatever so about actually investing into the lifestyles and the livelihoods of your players ensuring that they have that environment that's something that Dan kia have done just so perfectly um when coming into the apac region here in rainbow six and they're reaping the rewards for it evidently and we're seeing that here in the major it's a really nice story as well for the players just because of where they came from. I mean, Yas, uh, who is on the team, he was formerly of Scars, which, um, you know, other than their first place win in Pro League Season 11, which was a bit of a fluke based more on Cloud9's performance than their own, uh, Scars never found a ton of success. But then going into GC Busan, which was a new name for a lot of people in Rainbow Six, I obviously originally came from Overwatch and GC Busan was very famous in Overwatch for being the feeder team to some of the greatest players of all time and the first Overwatch League World Champion of London Spitfire. Um, so I, I was already familiar with the fact that GC Busan uh, have been really good in the past at generating and developing talent that then gets sold on to bigger orgs and, and become these superstars. And it was something that Monty spoke about a little bit on the desk because naturally he has a lot of experience with Korean orgs. Um, and it does feel like that story is playing out here in Rainbow Six right now. And I'm really happy to see it as much as I'm like, you know, biased Latam caster and I have predicted that NIP were gonna win this whole thing. I predicted that Pino was gonna be the MVP by the way of the entire event um as much as i i really wanted to see nip do well i'm really invested in this story and i hope that it it's kind of this pioneering beacon for other orgs to follow suit uh, who may want to invest into rainbow six because they're doing something right this is of course one of the greatest showings of any apac team in r6 event history especially an asian team because a lot of people are going to bring up Fnatic, and this could be a sign of what's to come in playoffs naturally we're going to have to wait an extra day for that we don't know who they're going to be playing against yet in fact their their final game has yet to be played uh but I'm very excited to see where this team are going to go in playoffs and of course beyond okay and the biggest crazy thing I don't think anybody's going to disagree with me here. If you do, you're crazy. The tiebreaker game between Team One and Cyclops Athlete Gaming. Holy shit. Holy shit. Okay, this basically shook the entire scene because in Rainbow Six and basically any esport, when it comes to sorting out who should be seeded higher in certain situations you have to go through a number of different scenarios things like round differential head-to-head -head, mini league all these things if all of them are still even eventually you get to the instance of a tiebreaker but that has never happened in rainbow six history before and it is so rare that you will ever have the likelihood of that even being relevant and yet in this game it became so this was a really important game. Uh, Cyclops have been playing out of their mind. There's been a, a, a ton of amazing clips of the team going around on social media, just being shared after uh, a few of their, their games. They were looking to be the second APAC team to be making playoffs. They'd previously beaten Team 1 7-2 on Oregon, which meant in order to get to the tiebreaker situation, Team 1 had uh, to get 7-2 against Cyclops. And that seemed really unlikely. And then it happened. <laughs> There was a lot of tension and you know it was an important game because they actually shifted it over to the A stream and booted off whatever the other game that was going on was. Um, but the thing is like, Chalet's a decent map for both of these teams. But when you have a look at team one, they have a 100% win rate on it over the last three mo uh, months. And it is the single most banned map against them. They've had it banned against them 18 times in that time. Meanwhile, Cyclops have an 86% win rate on it over three months, but they never really have it banned against them because usually teams are going to be banning maps like Oregon and Consulate against them instead. So already going into that map for me, 
um i had a little bit of a bias towards team one and i guess you never know what's kind of going on like mentally um that's going to drive either of those two teams you also have to consider cyclops's situation at si where it was basically going to be either them or cloud nine to not make playoffs and it ended up being cyclops who narrowly didn't make playoffs uh and this was basically going to be their opportunity to redeem themselves after that, you know, rectify what happened. And with the way that we've seen them play throughout the course of the group stage here in Mexico, it seemed entirely feasible that that was going to be the case. So to have that wrenched away from them right at the last second, that's just gut wrenching. And if you're a Cyclops fan, you will have really felt that. So there's been a ton of crazy moments in the group stage at Mexico, and I don't think anybody expected this event to be as wild as it has been it's honestly been one of the most fun to watch as a spectator um but playoffs are still around the corner we've got to still have the seeding draw find out who's going to be playing whom in the playoffs and then fucking god knows what's going to happen after that as i say i originally predicted nip was going to win and that pino was going to be the mvp so i'm not entirely sure who i would be leaning toward now uh as being the winner i would love for it to be down one i think that would be amazing um but uh, i mean right now i probably wouldn't be too surprised if it ended up being someone like space station i mean probably space station or team liquid for me i actually really underestimated team liquid going into this event and i feel like i need to repent for that but i'll do that in my own time um <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought some of the craziest moments from the group stages were and uh, how you feel about the comments that I made about the crazy moments that I found from the group stages because, you know, none of us were really going to foresee any of this happening. But to know that it has happened, it's just these crazy moments in Rainbow Six history that just keep stacking up. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll be back doing more content soon. But until then, goodbye.